911, what is your emergency? It's Valentine's Day 2018. I believe there's a shooter at the school. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School is under siege. An active shooter is terrorizing the campus. It was just a normal day at school that suddenly turned to a nightmare for the city of Parkland, Florida. The massacre marked the deadliest high school shooting in U.S. history. Surveillance video and witness identification led to the arrest of then 19 year old Nicholas Cruz. He was in my class yeah, in seventh grade and I knew he wasn't okay when he punched the window in and said, I'm gonna cause karma one day because he got in trouble with the teacher. Cruz was a former student at the school. He'd been expelled the year before in February 2017 for disciplinary reasons. But records indicate he was a troubled person long before the massacre. He was a huge threat to the school because of his behavior. When he was suspended, they found shells of bullets in his backpack. Just 40 days earlier, a woman who knew Cruz told the FBI he was collecting guns and ammunition and feared he was, quote, going to slip into a school and start shooting the place up. What's more, investigative reports point to years of a disturbing digital trail. Cruz reportedly researched mass shootings and posted threatening messages all over the internet. This one says, I'm going to be a professional school shooter. In fact, it would be those very phone records as well as school surveillance video that would help authorities piece together what they say happened. A little after 2 p.m., Cruz took an Uber from his home to the school about three miles away. Security video shows a male wearing black jeans, maroon shirt, vest and hat, carrying a large black bag, enter building 12. In the first floor stairwell, he takes out an AR-15 rifle. Just then, a student walks in, sees the gun, and hurries out at 2.21 p.m. School video shows the active shooter terrorizing all three floors of the freshman building, taking the lives of 14 teenagers and three adults. Alerted by a fire alarm and what sounded like gunshots, the school resource officer, the only other person armed with a weapon on campus, makes his way towards the building but does not go in. We started hearing more and more shots so then everyone started running. Minutes later, the shooting finally stops. The suspect drops the weapon and tactical gear and authorities say he left campus, blending in to the crowd. Police hadn't even entered the building yet. At 3.36 p.m., more than an hour later, Cruz was stopped and arrested. Authorities interrogate Cruz and appear to secure a confession. He is charged with 17 counts of first degree premeditated murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. During hours long questioning, Cruz informs the detective he hears voices in his head that tell him to burn, kill, destroy. Cruz now faces the death penalty at trial. Uh, I understand fully what you're saying. Okay, are you having any trouble concentrating? No, no. His lawyers say Cruz is prepared to plead guilty in return for a life sentence, an offer the prosecutors have rejected. And that issue at the forefront uh, inside the courtroom during some legal arguments. And now you've got Cruz and his team alleging prosecutorial misconduct conduct. Let's bring in Court TV special contributor Ashley Banfield, who's with us tonight. Um, Ashley, let's just start here. Number one, uh, the big issue is death penalty. Um, we're not going to debate. Well, maybe we will a little bit on the death penalty, right? <laughs> um, but that's the whole issue in this case, because it doesn't seem the defense is going to say he didn't do it. The, the whole trial will be about whether or not he gets the death penalty which is the law down in Florida. Florida has a death penalty. Prosecutors are seeking it. Um, this is a horrific, horrific case. I mean, there's no question about it, right? 17 people dead, 17 people injured, which accounts for the 17 attempted murder charges as well as the 17 first degree premeditated murder charges. I mean, this young man, and I say young because I think he's what, 22 right now? Uh, he's in for a world of hurt. His life is over, no matter what, it's either physiologically over or just, you know, metaphorically over. Um, however, the, the in, you know, the arguments that his lawyers make are intriguing. They did say something that um, 
I'm having a tough time grappling with actually, Vinny, and I'd love to, you know, hear how you weigh in on it. They say that I think there's 1,075 people on the prosecutor's witness list. Now you think of yourself for a moment as a defense attorney trying to prepare for trial, trying to go over the witnesses, do background checks, find out what you can so that you can be prepared at trial to cross-examine. And 1,075 witnesses sounds crazy until you look at the pictures and you realize that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School had hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of kids. So it's a bit of a, a sticky wicket, right? If you're gonna shoot up a place in a mass murder kind of way, well, then you can't argue about lots and lots of witnesses if in fact the allegations against him are true. Absolutely. So let's get first to the uh, death penalty arguments that were made in court. Let's take a listen. We filed on the 21st, I believe, of September, a motion to prohibit the state from seeking the death penalty. Um, and we would ask that the court order the state to respond in 30 days to that motion. And we filed yesterday our motion for um, our response in opposition to the uh, jury view of the crime scene. Judge, we'll have uh, our response uh, to the death penalty you know, sometime this week. Okay. Thank you. So again, this is the, the big issue. And so they're, they're attacking it uh, on legal grounds with the judge. And then if they're not successful there, uh, that'll be the focus of the trial. And, it, and it's fascinating because I've seen a few trials like this, and I know you have as well, where there really is no defense. The whole trial is about trying to keep someone off Process. of death row. So they, they lay the groundwork for all of that during the guilt phase, even though it's not the penalty phase. They kind of concede it but they laid the groundwork uh, for it during that part. And, and I'm wondering what the basis is going to be. I guess I think a lot of it will be um, his life, which, you know, he didn't have a great life. I mean, that's, I, I think, has to be conceded by the defense, to, by the prosecution to a certain extent, that Cruz had sort of a rough life. He bounced around, lost parents that passed away and, and bounced around a little bit. I think the family he was with at the end, though, was doing their best to, uh, to take care of him and kind of, uh, you know, took him in. Yeah, I think if we did a survey on uh, defendants who are facing the death penalty for crimes, I think that we have a pretty high percentage uh, who didn't have a great life. Uh, so for what it's worth. Um, but I was super interested to hear the constitutional amendments that were cited by these lawyers in saying that this man is not getting his due process or his constitutional right to a fair trial. In, you know me, I am I have one of these nerdy things, the, the Constitution, at my desk. And I looked it over, and it's the 5th, the 6th, the 8th, and the 14th Amendments that are being cited in the motions that his defense lawyers are presenting. Uh, the 5th, you usually think of as, you know, you don't want to incriminate yourself. But in this particular case, it's not. It's the deprivation of life, liberty, without due process that, that's the, at issue. Because I think they're saying, look, we're not getting discovery. I mean, the, the complaint is that... Uh, that the state has failed to comply with the rules of discovery and has general has had general misconduct during the prosecution, both intentional and negligent. That's the that's what the lawyers for Nicholas Cruz are saying. The Sixth Amendment we usually think of as the speedy trial, right? Well, it's been what three years now, I think, since this incident, um, give or take, and, and that's not the issue. The issue in the Sixth Amendment is that the defendant has the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation and to be confronted with the witnesses against him and to have compulsory process for obtaining uh, witnesses, um, to be fair. That's the issue with the witness list, right? We can't possibly go over all these witnesses and do the right thing. Then the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, there's the death penalty. And the Fourteenth Amendment, again, due process and equal protection under the law. So it's, I, I do think they're making an interesting argument. Look, if you're the lawyer uh, for, for Nicholas Cruz, um, you don't have a lot to work with, right? So you work with everything you can. And, and that's where they're going. Let's, let's take a listen. They talked about that issue of the large witness list. Um, let's hear how that went back and forth today. There's no law that says that we have to list any other witnesses other than the people that know something about the case. We don't know who they're going to call. They haven't even provided us, uh, you know, who they're 
defense is going to be, if they're going to rely on mental health. We're just sitting and waiting. Judge, oh. they, um, I'm sorry. The, the state has announced ready for trial uh, many, many times. I mean, I don't, and I'm not, we're not suggesting that there's a law that requires them to provide us a good faith witness list. What we're asking for in order to speed our preparation and prevent us from wasting hours and hours of our time as we did already, uh, we're just asking that they tell us. We've given them a list of 139 witnesses, as Mr. Sapp said. They've given us list, a list of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses. And if what they're saying is they're intending to call every one of them, so be it. Then we need to prepare for every single one of those witnesses and any motion that goes with it. But if they want us to speed our preparation, they can help us in this way. You know, the other part of this, uh, Ashley, and, and I don't know if it's going to happen in this case, but in most criminal cases down in Florida, there are depositions before trial. <laughs> could, could you imagine 800 de depositions and, and everything is happening? So, you know, from the defense yeah. perspective, I don't know how much of a rush they're in because they're basically conceding life without the possibility of parole, right? So yeah. they're not thinking he's getting out anyway. So, right. I, well, so why not? Right. Why not just go for it? Just like, you know, let's waste some process. Vinny, I'm sorry. Did you say you didn't want to talk about the merits or the merits of the death penalty? Because this is one of them. What's the point? What a waste of time. What a horrible waste of resources. If we have to because I think we're paying for his lawyer, right? The state's going to pay for his lawyer. So the state has to pay for its work and the state has to pay for his work. And you have got to go through all of the double interviews. Folks in Florida, y'all are paying for the depositions if they happen of all 1,075 witnesses on the state's list. And then again, all of them that are going to be deposed on. It's a waste. Honestly, I mean, again, here I am on my soapbox. Um, but it costs millions of dollars to kill people. And I think most people believe the death penalty is cheaper because, oh, gosh, it's just one bullet. But if you add all the appeals and all the due process... Uh, and then how, you know, the 20 years that it takes of litigation, it's more expensive to kill people. I, I don't put a price tag on it. I mean, if you want to say it's more expensive in terms of the emotional roller coaster that can be that involved, too. that, I mean, I understand that part of the argument. The way I look at it is each state gets to decide if it's the law or not. And in case mm -hmm. in states where it is the law, and then you look at the case and you say, okay, if we're going to have the death penalty, then we have to use it, right? No, use no, I'm it. with you on that. And, and you and I, I think we, look, we appreciate the law when it's codified, right? We're not, we're not treason. <laughs> look, I get it. I'm just saying that's only one of my um, frustrations with the death penalty is that it is, this is an example. But in this case, but in this case, you know? Ashley, in this case, you won't have the other problem that you have. We know he, you know, we know he did it because the defense is basically conceding that already and publicly saying he'll plead guilty, meaning, yeah, he is the one responsible. Yeah. So it wouldn't but you be can't cherry pick, you know, you can't cherry pick cases. If you're going to have the death penalty, you're going to have accidents. So I guess my point is, sure, for a lot of cases, you know, the guy did it. And like I've always said, morally, I could probably pull the lever myself if it were uh, my mother who was attacked or my sister or my brother. So it's not about that. It's about having a system whereby we can be certain because death is certain and you don't get a mulligan. And yet hundreds uh, hundreds of our death penalties have had to be revisited or exonerated because, oops, <laughs> we just didn't do it right. So I say across the board, if you're not Jesus and you ain't perfect, you shouldn't be in the business of killing. All right. We will once again agree to disagree. Oh, and by the way, I'm not saying I believe in Jesus either. So I don't want people to get all crazy on me and say this is a religious argument. That's not it. That's just metaphorically. If you can't be perfect, don't act perfect. Okay. All right. <laughs> Ashley Banfield, always a pleasure. We will speak again. Pleasure's mine. Yep, absolutely. All right. is there, and I'm assuming there's no law on this to guide the court as to whether or not I can require these things to be done via Zoom. I mean. Well, they're being done now, even by the public defender's office. <clears throat> Judge, my office is not doing remote evaluations at this time. David Whitman, on behalf of Mr. Cruz.
Where are you, Mr. Oh, I see you, Mr. Wheeler. Your office is not doing any evaluations via Zoom. That's correct, Judge. You know, just so you know, we were revised by um, BSO that um, not Mr. Wheeler personally, but other um, homicide uh, defense attorneys in the public defender's office were doing it. Um, so that, that was the basis of our information. That was from BSO. Mr. Wheeler, is there a chance that you might be mistaken? Judge, if, if a homicide does come in, uh, we might have an expert perform an assessment to try to get a, uh, I guess, an impression at first glance. Okay. But it's not an evaluation, ma'am. Okay, I'm just sort of thinking, that's why I'm waiting. <laughs> uh, obviously this is a new area for everyone and um, there's not gonna be a whole lot of guidance from from the courts on this because you know we've only just all been in this situation for a little over what six months now so um so state you're asking me to order the pd's office to start their uh interviews via zoom and the public defender's office is objecting is that uh, the gist of it yes your honor okay. uh, I, I'm taking the, the, uh, the state is asking that the jury view, I'm, I'm summarizing the jury view motion and response, as well as the motion to uh, prohibit the state from seeking the death penalty. Once those motions and responses are in, the state is asking that I, that I rule based upon the pleadings. The defense is asking for a hearing on both. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So... Um, other than that, it, how are we doing as far as progressing in discovery and getting everything else that needs to be done finished, hopefully by the end of the year when the courthouse opens or the beginning of the year, when the courthouse opens, we can get going. Judge, we're continuing to take depositions. We have them set uh, through November. Oh, I'm sorry. We also filed, I forgot about this one, a um, motion for a good faith witness list. Uh, I don't know if the court has had a chance to look at the um, motions to suppress we filed and the, and the responses. That's part of the reason we filed this motion. We've um, spent hours, uh, Mr. Ehrman, starting with him and then uh, Ms. McNeil and I go doing these motions only to find out that the state's response on many of them is we're either not calling that witness or we're not even going to try to elicit an identification from that witness. So if we... Uh, are able to get um, an actual witness list, or even if it's uh, partially accurate, it would be helpful in terms of saving us time. Every time we take a deposition, Mr. Ehrman or Mr. Wheeler, they spend time preparing for it and preparing to ask questions with the purpose of eventually filing motions to suppress or motions in limine, and then the actual writing of them uh, we do a lot of research on them. And then, you know, if we were to find out later, they're not calling the witness or they're not going to try to even elicit the testimony we're seeking to preclude, then we've just spent hours and hours for no reason. So um, if they could provide us with that list, we can look it over and then we can uh, look at those witnesses and focus depositions on those witnesses, focus our motions on those witnesses. Um, so we're also asking that uh, the court order the state to respond to that in 30 days. Your Honor, that is uh, ridiculous. The law doesn't call for that. We list the A witnesses and the C witnesses. They've even requested of us to take deposition of the C witnesses. We agreed. Uh, they have provided 139 witnesses themselves. Uh, we don't know who they're going to call. Our, our obligation is to provide information uh, as the witnesses who know something about the case and that's what we have done. As they even point out in their request, there is no law demanding that we do that. And we're being as thorough as we can and that witness list uh, is appropriate and there's no law that says that we have to list any other witnesses other than the people that know something about the case. 
We don't know who they're going to call. They haven't even provided us, uh, you know, who their uh, defense is going to be, if they're going to rely on mental health. We're just sitting and waiting. Judge, oh. I'm, <clears throat> I'm sorry. The, the state has announced ready for trial uh, many, many times. I mean, I don't, and I'm not, we're not suggesting that there's a law that requires them to provide us a good faith witness list. What we're asking for in order to speed our preparation and prevent us from wasting hours and hours of our time as we did already, uh, we're just asking that they tell us. We've given them a list of 139 witnesses, as Mr. Sapp said. They've given us lists, a list of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses. And if what they're saying is they're intending to call every one of them, so be it. Then we need to prepare for every single one of those witnesses and any motion that goes with it. But if they want us to speed our preparation, they can help us in this way. I mean, why not just do this the old-fashioned way? I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm on a different planet here, but what happened to just start calling up the other side and saying, hey, I'm getting ready to spend a whole lot of time preparing a motion to suppress on witness A and B. Are you even going to be calling these witnesses? Can you can you do me the courtesy of letting me know now before I have to file this? And if they say they're not calling them, then ask them to put it in writing. So, that, I mean, couldn't that be some, isn't that an idea that might work? Judge, it could, and, and we can try that, although we have tried that before in the context of, <clears throat> excuse me, witnesses who don't want to have to appear or are unable, for whatever reason, to appear for deposition. Um, and we've said, you know, if it's based on uh, not wanting to subject them to having to deal with this situation, we ask them for a stipulation, and in some instances, they're unable to do that. They can't, they won't commit to not calling the witness, so we don't know. If they're willing to do that with respect to any of the witnesses, then we're happy to do that. Well, at least that would be a step in the direction of shaving off some time. If they're not willing to do it, they're not willing to do it, then I guess you have to go forward because there's nothing, I agree with Mr. Satz, there's no law that says I have to require them to do that. Even at the time of trial, I can't require them to do that. Uh, I can say, call your next witness, but I, I can't order the state to tell what witnesses they're calling and, and, and so on and so forth. So my suggestion would be reach out, try to get some kind of stipulation, let them know that the, the, what you're relying on, um, and so on and so forth, and maybe a stipulation can be done before you have to do all that work. But that, that's, that's a suggestion. Obviously, it's not an order. Um, I think my hands are tied when it comes to your request as far as the law is concerned. So I'm going to reset this again for a status. I want to look into these few issues that have been brought up. Um, All right, I'm going to set this for November 17th at 8.30 for another status. I'm going to review these motions. I'm going to determine specifically whether the two that have been brought to my attention that I do agree need a hearing or do not need a hearing. Um, and um, I'm going to ask someone from the sheriff's office to be present at the next hearing, uh, maybe their legal counsel, so that they can give us an idea of when these people are going to be um, allowed to go inside of the jail. And um, I think that's it for today. Is there anything else on the lead case, the murder case? No, just, just, just if, um, if you're denying our mission for a good faith witness list uh, based on the, the comments that you've made, that can you uh, give us an order on that one? Yes, as soon as I, I just want to take a look at the exact motion so that I can name it exactly, my order exactly what... Um, Thank you. I do see, a, I, I just saw on my desk is sitting a stipulation where you all are agreeing that certain witnesses won't be called. There is one judge, yes. And then there was another one where <clears throat> they weren't, <clears throat> excuse me, able to enter into a stipulation at this time. Okay, well, better than nothing. So, um, and I do have your motion for a good faith witness list and um, I will enter an order today, okay? Thank you. I'll see you all. Um, oh, and how about the the eighteen one four one two nine? I see Ms. Schneider and Mr. Burke are present. I think I saw both of them. Yes. Good morning, Your Honor. Maria Schneider on behalf of the state. 
Good morning, Your Honor. Joseph Burke on behalf of Mr. Cruz. Hi, how are you? So I'm going to continue this along with the other case to November 17th at 8.30. That's fine, Judge. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor.